Who's glad to be at church this morning? Let's hear it. So good to see you guys. Hope you guys all have your popcorn. Uh, welcome to New Story Church and part two of our summer series at the movies where we are actually taking an intentional break and uh, worshiping God together as a family with all of our students. As a matter of fact, can we give a hand to all of our students in the house and our student ministry volunteers? So good to worship with you guys together. You know, growing up in church uh, all my life, basically, even when I was a small child, we would have these occasional family services uh, together as well, uh, especially during like Easter and Christmas. And I'll just be completely honest, uh, I was not a fan of those Sundays uh, in particular. I know this is very hard to believe, uh, but um, I was kind of like a squirmy, wormy little kid. I couldn't sit still uh, during service. Like all you students in here right now, like you are just angelic. I mean, you are well behaved. Uh, you're much better than I was. My parents would threaten me, especially on those Sundays. You got to sit right next to me. You better not move. You better not say anything. And uh, I would still somehow manage to, like, I have a little sister. She's six years younger than me. I would, like, poke her, make her scream. I would uh, make um, uh, uh, paper planes out of the offering envelopes. You know what I'm talking about? Like, remember those things? Like, you would, if you grew up in church, there was, like, an offering envelope in front of you. Make paper planes. Uh, there was this one time. We'll just keep this as a secret here. Uh, pastor asked a rhetorical question during the middle of his message. It was a rhetorical question. Place was dead silent, and I made one of those loud farting noises right at the hour. You know, and that—that that was me. Okay, and uh, and now I'm a pastor. Okay. <laughs> See how God curses you? No, I'm just kidding. He doesn't curse you. Uh, years later, though, I had a seminary professor uh, back in Dallas, uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, who said something which really resonated with me. And I forget a lot of things from seminary, but I'll never forget this one thing that he said um, because it spoke to the squirmy little kid inside of me as well as to the pastor that now stands behind a pulpit. What he said was, it is a sin to bore people with the Bible. It is a sin to bore people with the Bible. And you know, to be honest, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, that's a little bit of our heart and method uh, behind this particular summer series. Uh, as we said last week, though Hollywood is a multi-billion dollar industry whose job is to tell good stories, right? We can't possibly compete with that, right? It's a billion or multi-billion dollar industry. We all know that the greatest stories, whether on the silver screen or in the pages of a book, the greatest stories are but mere reflections, dim reflections, actually of the greatest stories told in this book, right? And, and Jesus himself was the master storyteller. In fact, one of the passages that we went over last week was found in the Gospel of Matthew where it reads this way, all Jesus did that day was tell stories. A long storytelling afternoon. His storytelling fulfilled the prophecy. What was the prophecy? The prophecy was, I will open my mouth and tell what? Tell stories, I will bring out into the open things hidden since the world's first day. Now, don't let it be lost on you. Notice how this passage says that some of the deepest, most profound truths known to mankind, things hidden since the world's first day, are actually revealed. They're not propositional truths, but stories. Stories. It's why I appreciate so much with Professor of Renaissance and Reformation, Dr. Grant Horner's uh, insight in when he said, the discerning Christian will seek to watch movies with a theological perspective. They will then seek to use that information to better engage people within the culture with the truths of scripture and the hope of Jesus Christ. We want to leverage everything around us for the hope of Jesus Christ. What better of a way to do it when Hollywood is in our backyard? So, with that in mind, we're gonna to turn to our featured film of the day, Toy Story 4. Yeah, okay, we got some Toy Story. How many of you guys have seen any of the Toy Story films? Go ahead and raise your hand, maybe even some of the spinoffs, Buzz Lightyear. Okay, most of us, about 80, 90% of this room right now, okay? Uh, go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me, that's right. 
You got a friend in me, and you have one in me as well. You know, believe it or not, friends, uh, the Toy Story franchise is kind of a big deal, right? It's not just a kid's movie. Uh, For instance, did you know uh, that the original Toy Story, uh, you know, when it came out in 1995, was the first fully animated uh, 3D feature film? First one of its kind, uh, created again in 1995 by a startup, a little tiny startup company that no one heard of at the time called Pixar, right? Which was led by a guy named Steve Jobs who got fired from his own fruit company, right? A couple years before, yeah? And uh, since then, Toy Story Films has grossed more than, I can't believe this, this is an astronomical number, $3.2 billion worldwide. By the way, that is more than all of the Hunger Game movies, more than all the Frozen movies, Lion King, and even Superman films. More than those things, right? And by the way, what's interesting is we're not even talking about... uh, any of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the dollars that the Toy Story franchise has made uh, through its comic books, clothing, merchandise, video games, theme parks, and of course, toys. Not, not a cent of that kind of money goes in towards the $3.2 billion uh, that I just mentioned before. Now, what's interesting is much of the Toy Story franchise, uh, much of its success is because Toy Story, like I said before, is not just a kid's movie. Uh, Because it actually deals with many mature themes like the concepts of growing up and moving on. It talks about love and loss in almost each uh, of those movies. As well as some of the biblical themes we're going to tackle today like redemption and calling. We're talking about redemption and calling today. So whether you're a child or the parent of one, uh, Toy Story's intentional approach to connect with both is super appreciated. Uh, You see this in everything that they do, including in their marketing. As a matter of fact, have a look. Oh! Uh Uh Oh, no, you didn't. You don't even care, Ah, man. Hey, you are a I don't care bear. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Oh, Oh, man. Ducky. Yeah. You see the new movie trailer? For what? You ain't see it? See what? What is it, buddy? Ducky. What? They're making another Toy Story movie. No! I thought those movies were done, dog. They made three movies. They did make three movies. This is number four. Oh, shoot! Come <laughs> on! I love the Toy Story, dog. Uh, Toy Story is my Toy jam. Does it, what, wait, what about Buzz Lightyear stuff? I am Buzz Lightyear, Space Ranger. <laughs> and then Woody's like, you are a toy! Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Woody. Do the flying <laughs> thing he does. Do it, do it, oh, do oh. it. <clears throat> To infinity and your mom. <laughs> that's it. So, wait, what? Yeah. That's not right. You sure? No, that's not right. I'm pretty sure that's it. No, 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 let me show you. To insanity and a blonde. What are you even that's how it goes. saying? No, that's how it goes. To immunity and respond. To indecency to and infrequently. Hey, hey, guys, you got it all wrong. It's to infinity and beyond. <laughs> 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 That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You can't go to infinity, <laughs> dummy. It's, it's impossible. He over here talking about infinity. You don't go beyond infinity. You don't know nothing about science. <laughs> you know, they say that humor is the hardest genre to master, but these guys, they do a great job of it, right? Uh, this Oscar winner for Best Animated Feature picks up actually where the first three movies left off, Uh, namely a boy named Andy who grew up with all these toys. Uh, By the time we get to Toy Story 4, he's now older and he's moving off to college. Uh, I have a child that's uh, going off to college next year and I'm already kind of feeling the the, the emotions of this, right? He goes off to college and uh, what he does is he basically, he, he takes this collection of toys and he hands them off to a little girl. This little girl is named Bonnie. Right? She's a pre-K at the time, uh, just about to uh, enter into kindergarten. And among those toys are the two beloved characters from the original movies. I'm talking, of course, about Sheriff Woody, right, whose voiceover is Tom Hanks. Right? He, was the, uh, he was the leader of the toy group. Right? He was Andy's favorite toy. Right? And there's uh, Buzz Lightyear, whose voiceover is Tim Allen. Uh, he started out in the movies as, as kind of Woody's rival. Uh, But by the end of it all, uh, they become best of friends. They're sort of the perfect odd couple. Now, I have a theory in life that you are either a Woody guy or you're a Buzz guy. How many of you are Woody people? Go ahead and raise your hand. Let's give you a hoop and holler for the Woody 
people, okay, a mild smattering. I'm a, Buzz Lightyear people, right, well, go ahead, let me hear you. Buzz Lightyear. Okay, oh, all right, okay, all right. Well, then maybe, maybe you're a fan of this third character because at the time we hit Toy Story 4, we're introduced to another main character. His name is Forky, okay, Forky. All right, yeah, okay, we got some Forky fans in here, okay? Uh, Forky is a ragtag makeshift doll made out of a, uh, just a, just a genius invention, a spork, right? Half spoon, half a fork, and some leftover uh, odds and ends, right? Uh, that, that, but basically, this very scared little girl, Bonnie, uh, on her first day of kindergarten, she had no friends, she didn't know anybody. She didn't want to go to school. She didn't know what school was. Like, I don't want to go. She's crying. She's throwing a fit. Uh, and, and so basically, she, this little girl who on first day of kindergarten has no friends, she basically made a friend. She made Forky, right, out of, out of this leftover stuff. Now, believe it or not, you and I, child, parent of a child, we all have so much to learn from our friend Forky. In fact... I would ask you this, ask yourself, does Forky's origin story remind you of any other origin stories? Check this out. Okay class, craft time. Hello, I'm Forky. We got this kindergarten thing under control, eh? I can't believe I'm talking to a spork. <laughs> Everyone, Bonnie made a friend in class. What a oh, kid. she's already making friends. No, no, she literally made a new friend. I want you to meet Forky. Uh, hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ah. <gasps> Shoots and ladders. All good stories are but dim reflections of the greatest stories found in Scripture, yeah? And I hope you see it here. Do you, do you see what's happening right here? Do you, do you, do you notice what, what you just witnessed there? Created from random pieces of trash. We actually literally, uh, I was like slacking the, the staff. Hey, guys, do we have, anyone have access to a spork? And we, none of us, we, we went to Popeye's. We couldn't find the right spork. And this was actually, this was found in the trash. This was actually found in the parking lot of, of New Story Church, right? So, so spor, Forky is actually, he's made from these random pieces of trash, right? A spork, a broken popsicle stick, a little piece of pipe cleaner. Uh, and all so much more than the sum of his parts. Because why? Because Forky is somehow loved and made alive. And does this narrative sound familiar in any way? Perhaps the origin story of ourselves and a creator God who lovingly made us from what? From dust. Again, Scripture actually says it first, right? In the book of Genesis chapter 2, the second chapter of the Bible, it says, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Friends, let's, let's not gloss over this, yeah? The creator literally formed mankind, all of humanity, from the dust of of the ground, worthless, meaningless dust. Afterthought particles at best, microscopic waste at worst. Yet the God of the universe gathered together dust from the ground. <sighs> and blew into it emotions, intelligence, a soul and spirit into dust, and it became man. Think about that. God breathed the breath of life into the dust of the ground, and it became a living image bearer 
of himself. You talk about making something from nothing. This is incredible. What kind of love is this? What kind of majesty is this? And oh, by the way, did you catch, did you catch that, that little subtle piece at the very end of the clip that we just saw? How on the bottom of the created feet, Bonnie, the maker, did what? She wrote her name on a creation. As if to say, <laughs> I'm not going to lose you. I'm not going to lose you. You're mine. I cherish you. I love you so much. Nothing's going to ever happen. I will not lose you nor forsake you. I, I love you. You're mine. Friends, did you know that even this is an echo of a greater story told before? Yeah, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah declared it this way. He told this to the people of God. He said, but now, thus says the Lord, he who created you. Oh, Jacob, he who formed you. Oh, Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. You were once considered trash, but now you are his treasure. I have called you by name. I know your name. I see you. I know who you are. You are mine. Friends, I don't care how old you are in this room or watching online. Every single one of us could use more of these divine and definitive messages of truth. Amen. We could all use more of this kind of loving, uh, possession, gracious, redemption, and sweet adoration truths in our lives, couldn't we? He who created you, formed you, redeemed you, and has called you by name. By name. Do you believe this? Do you truly believe that he who formed you, redeemed you, and now calls you by name? Because you would think, after all that like loving attention and, and very specific intentionality, right, to literally make something so wonderful out of nothing, you would think that Forky would at least be thankful, Yeah? That, that he would at least have a desire to, to live out his calling and just be a good and faithful toy to Bonnie, yeah? Well, that's not exactly what happens, right? Instead, like all of us who've also been intentionally and lovingly created, Forky shows some major, major signs of insecurity and fear, yeah? As a matter of fact, Throughout most of the movie, uh, if you know this, I hope there's no spoiler alert here, uh, but uh, Forky sees himself as disposable trash rather than a child's treasured toy. That, that's just how he sees himself. I'm just a dirty spork with wiry arms, he thinks to himself. You know, how, how could anyone love me? Why would anyone care about me? And yet Bonnie does. Bonnie really, really, she just does. She loves and cares. In fact, Forky is her favorite toy. She has all these other toys, but Forky's her favorite. But Forky still doesn't get it. So he's constantly on this self-destructive, self-sabotaging path, literally hurling himself. Every trash can you see in the movie, he wants to jump into, literally, Right? It's like he doesn't know how to handle true love and grace and goodness. It's like his body rejects all these good things. Instead, Forky would much rather settle for the familiarity of his past, even though it's trash, right? Because it's just easier and more familiar for him to relate, right? Now, haven't we all been there one way or another, right? Like maybe it's with an addiction, or some sort of destructive pattern or, or life choice that we can't unhook ourselves from, right? Some sort of hurt, habit, or hang-up? Uh, aren't there times in your life when it just feels like it'd be just so much easier just to give in? Like, I'm tired of all the fighting, trying to do, I'm tired of trying to do the right thing. It's just, it would be so much easier just to give in, right? Not live the right way. 
Yeah? Oh, am, am, I, am I the only one? Me and Forky, we're, we're the only ones that feel this way? Yeah? See, friends, if you're paying attention, do you see how this just isn't a kid's movie? Like, sometimes trash, it's just easier. Let's just be honest. Sometimes living like trash is just easier. Sometimes just going back to our past, it's just easier. No question, but it is never the best or even close. There's this one part of C.S. Lewis's classic, The Weight of Glory, which he describes this dynamic so well. He writes, he puts it this way, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Mud pies in the slum because we can't even fathom a day at the beach. We are far too easily pleased. Pleased. Friends, are you far too easily pleased this morning? I would ask you if you can identify with the following clip. I want you to meet Forky. Uh, hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ah. He's a spook. Yes, yeah, I know. Forky is the most important toy to Bonnie right now. We all have to make sure nothing happens to him. Woody, we have a situation. I am not a toy. I was made for soup, salad, maybe chili, and then the trash. Buzz, we've got to get Forky. Affirmative. Why am I alive? You're Bonnie's toy. You are going to help create happy memories that will last for the rest of her life. Huh? What? Oh, yeah, yeah. Guys, did you catch that one line? It's, it's so telling, right? Forky says, I am not a toy. I was made for soup, salad, maybe chili, and then the trash, yeah? Now, none of us would ever be so blunt. Like, like we would never say this out loud, right? Yet sometimes our lives betray us and demonstrate otherwise. In other words, sometimes the way that we live and interact with one another or even the thoughts that we have about ourselves sometimes communicate, I am not God's treasure. I was made for school, for work, maybe a little vacation, and then the grave. That's actually how we think sometimes, yeah? But that's not true. Those are lies straight from the pit of hell. When we think this way, we are overcome with a false spirit. There's a false spirit that's embedded in that kind of mindset. It is actually the same false spirit that we see in the Old Testament that haunted King Saul. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do do you know what the remedy was for King Saul back then when he would have these self-defeating thoughts? What the remedy was for a tormented soul haunted by a spirit of lies? 1 Samuel chapter 16 puts it this way. And it came to pass when the evil spirit was upon Saul that David took his harp and played with his hand. Basically, David made music. David sang. And scripture says, Saul was refreshed and it was well with him and the evil spirit departed from him. So don't miss this. David, the king to be, played his harp and sang music for the reigning king. Likewise, I want to say to everyone here today and watching online, those of you who feel haunted, who feel tormented with lies that you are somehow not loved, that you are somehow trash, regardless, I don't care what you've done in the past, I don't care what experiences you've had there that that make you feel this way, if what you hear is the lie that you are somehow trash rather than treasure... I want you to know that the maker, the heavenly maker, actually sings truth and love over you. God, do you know this, literally serenades you with songs of truth and refreshing and healing. Did you know this? 
The Old Testament prophet Zephaniah actually puts it this way. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Friends, don't miss this. God serenades you with love. You only have to be still and listen. See, some of you thought you were doing God a favor. Some of you thought you serenaded God for like 15 minutes every week at the start of a service. No, 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 that's not true. God has been singing over you this whole time. You are only echoing back to him a dim reflection of what he has already started long before, amen? Or in the words of scripture, we love because he first loved us. You know, in a movie last week, Free Solo, we touched upon the important concepts of vision and mission. In a nutshell, vision reveals purpose, mission unveils your passion and pursuits. And to grasp your God-given vision and mission is to understand God's call on your life. Remember Isaiah's prophecy, I have called you. I have called you. So what is God's call on your life? I need to ask you that this morning. What is God's call on your life? Or like Forky asked in the last clip, why am I alive? Right? Forky's always asking the big existential questions, isn't he? In fact, I didn't know this. Pastor Nathan, you pointed this out to me earlier in the week. Uh, The Disney Channel uh, apparently has an entire collection of shorts uh, called Forky Ask a Question. And he asks things like, you spend like five, ten minutes uh, and ask things like, you know, what is love? You know, what is time? What is a friend? I think we have that slide there, right? So like you can just, you know, peruse that if you will again, right? Uh, But what this shows is that, you know, these are the questions that any man, woman, or child that we all have. What is a computer? That's actually a hard question to answer, right? So what is God's call on your life? Why are you alive? See, friends, uh, that little boy version of me, right, that I shared in the beginning, right, that was squirming around in the pews, yeah, Uh, that little boy version of me, he was also a good little Presbyterian, okay, raised on the Westminster Catechism. Okay, so you're laughing. Anyone here raised on the Westminster Catechism? Okay, a couple of people, right? And so at a very early age, uh, I had to uh, recite, I had to memorize uh, parts of the Western uh, Shorter Catechism, right? Like question number one, what is the chief end of man? Uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. See also proof text, right? And so like just radiates joy in life, doesn't it? It just, it's just so good for the soul. But you know, uh, as I've gotten older and spent more time in his word, I've actually come to really appreciate uh, those truths, right? In other words, whatever your call in, is, in life is, whatever your life's aim, it must include the primary aspect of bringing glory to God and enjoying him forever. In fact, I would, even, I would even nuance it this way. I would even say that I, I don't think those are two separate things, like to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Like those are two separate positions, right? Those are two separate propositions, right? I, I don't even think it's two, right? I, I think it, it's actually one thing. You glorify God the most by enjoying him forever. Does that make sense? You glorify God the most when you enjoy him supremely, yeah? Some would call this approach the Christian hedonism, right? That's actually a a school of thought, and I'm here for it. I am totally here for it. The understanding that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. One more time. God is most glorified in your life when you are most satisfied with him. See also the writings of Jonathan Edwards, C.S. Lewis, John Piper, among others. The results take place in your life when your highest goal 
becomes glorifying God. I don't care what kind of vocation, what kind of job you have. I don't care what kind of role you have in life. Uh, when, when you make glorifying God by or when or and, enjoying him forever, when you make that your chief goal in life, when you understand that that is your chief goal in life, these three things happen, okay? You might want to jot these down and with them we're going to close, okay? Number one, when you make God, your, glorifying God your chief goal in life, when, when, you, when you exalt him forever, when you enjoy him, the first thing that happens is you stop feeling the pressure to perform. That just, it, it, it just, I won't say it goes away overnight, but it, it more and more, more and more, day by day, it dissipates. You stop feeling the pressure to perform. One of my girls asked me, oh, Dad, what are you on the Enneagram? I'm a three. The three is, is the, it, that's the performer. That's the achiever, right? Romans chapter five, verse one says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. Why do we have peace with God? Because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. So it no longer depends on what you do. It all depends on what Jesus has done for you. And so you are free from the, from the slavery, from the shackles of performing. It frees you from that, from that mentality. Number two, when you make glorifying God, worshiping God, enjoying him forever, your chief goal in life, when you understand that that is a part of your God-given call, you feel accepted rather than ashamed. Some of you need to remember that. You feel accepted rather than shamed. Uh, Romans chapter eight says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That passage talks about the, the rights of, uh, and the benefits of those who are chosen. It talks about Jesus interceding for you. So you no longer need to be ashamed. You should feel accepted. And the last thing is this. When part of your life's aim, when the part, the non-negotiable is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, guess what happens? You develop this boldness in approaching God. You, 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 there's always the, the fear and respect, as it were, right? He's, he's a holy God, but you now can approach him boldly. Scripture says in Ephesians, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Why? Because you're his child. Scripture says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Daddy. We cry, Abba, Father. Hebrews says, so let us come boldly to the throne. We can come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Not bad for a little kids movie, yeah? And so friends, here's what we're gonna do. As we present our tithes and offerings this morning, I've asked the band to do something a little special for us today. This is a little, little first time in, in, in terms of this portion of service. What I've asked the band to do is to lead us in a specific medley. I, I think that's the technical term for it, right? Uh, a medley of two songs uh, in one based on the message you just heard. And in the first portion of this song, you're going to notice truths we need spoken over us. Like these are truths, as, you, as, you, as the band leads us in this song, these are truths that we need sung over us. Remember Zephaniah, God sings over you. And in the second portion of this song are truths that we declare in worship as a response. One of my favorite definitions of worship is, worship is a response to revelation. So in this, in this, in this last song that we're gonna sing together, that second part, that, that last half, these are, these are truths that we declare back to God because his truth has been revealed to us because he himself has revealed himself to us. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna go, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. And then we're going to continue to worship him. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, Lord, um, you are the great storyteller. You are the master storyteller. And, and all the greatest stories that we can think of on screen and in the pages of a book, they are but dim reflections of what you've already told us and what you're constantly telling us through your spirit, by your word, through the community of God. And right now, Father, I know that there are people here that need some truths spoken over them. Right now, there are people here who have the, this, this a spirit of lies, this taunting, this haunting, this tormenting uh, thought and, and, and patterns in their lives. And Father, what they need to do is they just need to sit still and hear your voice and hear your truth to wipe away the fear, to wipe away the discouragement, the depression, to wipe away the anxiety. I pray that you would speak truth over us, sing truth over us. And like King Saul of old, with the tormenting spirits inside of us dissipate, would they flee at the sound of your voice? Father, as that happens, I pray, Father, that you would encourage us, stir up in us just this, this childlike spirit that wants to praise you and worship you, this childlike spirit that just wants to glorify you. Father, I pray for every single man, woman, and child here, Lord, that their highest aim would be to bring you glory by enjoying you forever. May you be their highest desire, their number one, their first love. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's stand together and worship, and let's sing this song.